happy to be uh, leading the NEH Abolitionist Movement Seminar and very happy to introduce our next guest speaker, uh, Professor Erica Armstrong Dunbar, who is now at the University of Delaware. She did her PhD work at Columbia University under a legendary mentor named Eric Foner. She is also the first director of the program in African American history here at the library company and doing amazing things. Recently helped secure a major Mellon grant to help fund that program. So there's going to be a lot of exciting activity at the library company over the next couple of years relating to the program in African American history. She's also the author of an indispensable book on free black women in Philadelphia and the urban north. It's entitled The Fragile Freedom. You had just a uh, chapter taste of that book and you can see how important it is because it's taking us into a part of the abolition story that we don't often get. Today she's going to take us back even further into uh, free black women's activism showing that before they were ever free they were struggling for freedom and uh, this is basically the foundation of a book she's going to tell you about. She's working on it now uh, it's going to be a massive bestseller when it comes out. I know because she's told me about it. Please help me welcome Professor Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Rich, for having me. This is always, uh, colleagues always joke about uh, oh, doing another summer institute with teachers, but you all really make us think. And um, I get so much from presenting my work to teachers uh, because I want this next project in particular to be an accessible read, uh, an accessible book, uh, one that we can use in college classrooms and that historians will read, but also hopefully other folks will read it too. Um, but a little, just a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a Philadelphian, and uh, I heard you say that if you're sort of born and raised in Philadelphia, and African Americans who are born and raised in Philadelphia, we don't really go far. Uh, we may go off here and there in New York or wherever, but we always seem to return in some kind of way. So uh, I have gone off and come back, and uh, uh, I'm a Philadelphian, and uh, as is my husband's side of the family, so I get to get up and think about and read about and write about folks who were connected to the city in which I live. Um, and it's, I feel very sort of honored and privileged to be able to do that um, every day. So yeah, I know you all read a little bit about the first book, and um, my interests are really in the 18th and 19th century African American women, and looking at how women, uh, black women in particular, made this transition from slavery to freedom. And the first book I sort of talk about how this transition was slow, uh, it was quite gradual, it was um, uh, something that allowed black women to negotiate freedom for themselves uh, over decades. The next project, or the project that I'm going to talk about today, Never Caught, the President's Runaway Slave Woman, moves us back in time a little bit. Um, so. Uh, while I'm going to uh, talk about Ona Judge, who I understand you all are now familiar with, you uh, was that correct yesterday or someday? You, okay, you had some kind of encounter with uh, with her narrative. Um, and so what I thought I'd do today is to share a little bit of this second book project that I'm working on, which is a study of her life. And it's a study of her life, but also how Ona Judge Staines, Staines is her married name, uh, really becomes, she is a part of this abolitionist narrative that appears by the 1840s. So uh, we have a couple of her um, interviews with abolitionist newspapers, and I'll get to them in a moment. She was not literate, she never learned to read or write, so she did not leave behind a a narrative like Jacobs or Douglas. Um, so we are fortunate, though, to have these uh, interviews with her in abolitionist newspapers. And they all appear around the same time that Douglas first publishes 
his work. So one of the things I like to think about with Ona Judge, although she her story starts much earlier uh, than most, she's a part of this new uh, cohort of abolitionist activists. She's not known the way Douglas is. She's not known uh, the way a Tubman is. Um, but nevertheless, still important. The other thing that we can do with Ona's story is to look at how slavery was changing region by region um, in the mid-Atlantic, in New England, and of course changing or not changing in Virginia, where she was from. So I'm going to talk a little bit about her. Um, for a while, I'll blah, blah, blah on for about Ona Judge for a while. Then we'll have a moment. We can take a small break. Uh, and then we can reconvene for some question and answer, and that can be about um, the narrative, Bona Judge, or anything else that you've read um, prior to today's meeting. So, uh, sometime around 1774, Ona Judge was born in Virginia. And she was born uh, a slave on George and Martha Washington's estate in Mount Vernon. Uh, she was a slave, later on a fugitive. We'll get to that part of the story. And she's an interesting woman to study because she finds her way from sort of the rural, uh, rural Virginia, eventually to a bustling New York City, uh, and then to a more bustling Philadelphia. And then later on to a kind of sleepy hamlet in Portsmouth, in Hampshire. Uh, and we can use her life and look at where she was, where she traveled, and where she ended up to understand um, her desire for freedom uh, and her bold and very risky decision to take her freedom from her masters, who were the most revered family in America. Uh, in the 1790s. Uh, she remained, she eventually escaped, remained in New Hampshire until her death in 1848. So uh, she lives well into her 70s, which is a fairly long lifespan for an African American woman. Uh, at this time, most um, African American women in New England didn't live beyond 40, 45 years in the 1790s up through the early 1800s, so the fact that she does uh, live is quite amazing. Um, also, we can use her story to look at just how complicated slavery and freedom becomes uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. So this is an image of um, Washington's residence, uh, where the Washingtons lived while in Philadelphia. If you remember the story, the first uh, executive house was in New York. That was the site of the first uh, capital of the nation. And shortly thereafter, it was moved to Philadelphia. And so this is where Ona Judge spent a majority of her time while she, once she came, uh, came north. So, I'm going to move us to February of 1796. I'm going to sort of start the story in the middle of her story, uh, and then move back <coughs> around to close up some, some loopholes. But I start with February of 1796, uh, because it was a sort of a, a difficult moment in the Washington household. Uh, there was a sort of palpable unease at the executive mansion in Philadelphia, and there was a thick tension that prompted Ona Judge and her companions to tread very lightly around George and Martha. Enslaved men and women always moved about their days with caution, not knowing what events could sweeten or sour a master's mood. For slaves who resided within the same walls as their master, life could be akin to walking through fields embedded with landmines. The unpredictability of everyday life 
forced slaves to perform their tasks with the almost impossible agility of staying one step ahead of their master. The smallest of matters could be the accidental breaking of a dish uh, or inconveniently timed bad weather could alter the mood of an owner. And although the president did not earn a reputation for being a, a sort of violent slave owner, he did on occasion lose his temper and own a judge knew this. Judge moved through her tasks at the president's house with a smooth watchfulness. She attended to Martha Washington in February in a very sort of tentative uh, and careful way. She had become Martha Washington's closest body slave. All who knew the Washingtons on a personal level were familiar with Judge. She often accompanied her mistress, uh, and once Martha became the um, first lady, although that's not a term that was used in the 18th and 19th century, but once she became the first lady, uh, she often had many social calls. And when she went on these visits, she would often take her slave with her. So Ona Judge would go with her to uh, some of the most prestigious and well-known founding fathers uh, to the homes of their wives and their daughters. So people in Philadelphia knew who Ona Judge was. They knew what she looked like, for she often accompanied uh, the First Lady. Their social calendar was extremely full. And one of the things that Martha's, the, the remaining letters from Martha Washington tells us is that she was exhausted. She was exhausted having come from Mount Vernon with a relatively kind of slow paced life, uh, had looked forward to time alone with George after he had returned from uh, the war, and that simply did not play out. Once he was elected president, everything was sort of moving at breakneck speed. So she often lamented in her letters that um, things were moving too fast, that she was almost not recognizing herself with her dress, with her uh, new speed of life. And um, the president was getting ready to celebrate his 65th birthday in February of 1796. They had a huge kind of ball planned uh, to honor it. Judge understood her mistress well. And she knew how Martha Washington's feelings shifted and moved. As her kind of main attendant or main body slave, she was responsible for the most kind of intimate um, needs that Martha Washington would have. Brushing her hair, helping her bathe, tending to her clothing, those kinds of very personal, intimate jobs. That was Ona Judge's responsibility. Um, so let me just back up. They move, eventually moved to the Philadelphia uh, Executive Mansion in 1790. So Judge is a teenager by then. She's 16-ish uh, or so. Uh, and this was a sort of typical age for um, a slave in her position. Although Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, had already begun to emancipate its slaves, Washington took his. He took them with him to New York at first. He took seven of them. And then when in Pennsylvania, uh, lived with nine. So it was very clear that although Washington was moving to states that had begun this move to dismantle slavery, he was not necessarily interested uh, in leaving his own slaves behind. He did have um, white paid labor in his homes, both in New York and in uh, here in Philadelphia, but his slaves traveled with him and his wife at all times. Martha uh, Washington relied quite a bit on Ona Judge, and she knew her mistress. She knew that her mistress cared about her grandchildren. Uh, she had outlived every single one of her children, Martha Washington did. Uh, all of her children were fathered by her first husband. Uh, remember, George was the second husband. Um, and high mortality rates, especially for children, claimed the lives of two of Martha's heirs before they reached their fifth birthdays. 
and two older children were lost in young adulthood, really leaving Martha Washington quite devastated. Uh, and what she did in, in turn is to uh, look towards her grandchildren. So Ona Judge knew that for Martha, at the center of her life were her grandchildren, as her, her own children uh, lived no more. Uh, although she was only 27 years old when she married George Washington, their marriage never yielded offspring. They never had children. Uh, and several historians have argued about why that was. Was it, did it have something to do with uh, George Washington's sterility because of bad dental issues? I'm not certain that that's all been worked out. But nonetheless, they had no living heirs between the two of them. George Washington had no children that we know of on his own. So uh, instead, Martha and George welcomed two of uh, Martha's grandchildren into their home, and they raised them as their own. And in many ways, Ona Judge helped to raise these children, too. Judge witnessed shock and concern <clears throat> on her master's faces after they read through the post on February 6th. The president received a letter from Elizabeth, his 19-year-old step-grandchild. She was called Betsy and Eliza by her friends and family. And this letter was the sort of bombshell letter from the, the young 19-year-old uh, granddaughter who told uh, her grandparents of her intention to marry. And the Washingtons had no idea that she was engaged, that she was involved with anyone seriously. And so let's, you know, we're, it's 1796. These are things you know about, right, in the 1790s. You know uh, who's courting who, and more than likely you've arranged it. So to hear this, to receive this letter um, from their granddaughter saying, I'm going to be married, sent them into a bit of a tizzy. Eliza wrote of her engagement to a man named Thomas Law. He was a British businessman. He had spent a considerable amount of time in India as a policymaker, and he emigrated to uh, America in 1794, so he'd only been here for about two years. He'd become in in involved in land speculation around Washington, D.C., and he was 20 years older than his intended. So this, of course, also raised some eyebrows. So his romance with Eliza quickly turned into an engagement. And George Washington, as Eliza's father was deceased, was the sort of natural person to step in to approve or reject this proposal. And the news sent the executive mansion into a tailspin. Although this was very personal family business, everyone who lived within the walls of the president's house knew exactly what was happening. As a slave, judge had to negotiate these boundaries between a house slave and uh, a slave master. It was an intricate relationship that made her and her other companions who were enslaved in, uh, in Washington's house, you had to sort of walk this line. You were, uh, you were there to serve, yet you were there during the most intimate moments of people's lives. You were there when babies were born. You were there when people died. You were there when engagements were announced. And so being privy to this kind of information, yet having to remain in this position as, uh, as a faithful slave was, also, was often very tricky, difficult. In these kinds of situations, slave owners sometimes look to their own slaves for good counsel, most certainly for comfort. Judge was most likely left with the task of consoling her mistress. Martha was not happy. And neither George nor Martha Washington knew about the seriousness of the relationship with Thomas Law. They were concerned about the union. They were concerned about Thomas Law. Aside from being older, which happened frequently in the 18th and 19th century. He came to Washington, D.C. with two of his three children, 
two of whom were biracial children. He had lived with an Indian woman. He had spent, he was from England, had spent a good deal of time in India. Uh, we don't necessarily know if he was married, um, but in any case had a long-standing relationship <coughs> with an Indian woman and brought his biracial, two of his three biracial children to Washington, D.C. with him, which made many lift an eyebrow. Would their dear Eliza be spirited away to a foreign country with her new spouse? Would he consent to remain in America? What would happen with these two children? Uh, her fate seemed very unpredictable, and this made the Washingtons uncomfortable. The laws. Uh, Judge, who was still a young woman, only about 22 by this time, was unable to provide any kind of informed comfort that older, more seasoned slaves were expected to offer in situations like these. The laws of Virginia denied Judge the ability to live within a legal marriage. Therefore, she had no practical advice to offer her mistress. But it was perhaps Judge's youth that provided Martha Washington with some consolation. Judge was young, but she was very confident. And Martha Washington watched her mature. She came with her to New York when she was a 16-year-old, 15-year-old, uh, and watched her mature into this very kind of confident, uh, faithful house slave. Judge was the same age as Eliza. And when the news of the engagement reached the executive mansion, Martha Washington watched the skilled and experienced judge on a daily basis and, and thought for a moment, well, perhaps Eliza isn't too young to marry. Look at judge. She's a competent woman. She's a young woman. She's able to take care of me and the household. Perhaps Eliza knows what she's doing, although Martha Washington never truly believed that. But then she had to remember herself that when Martha Washington first married, she was only 18. Women were young when they married. Ona Judge watched her owners feel their ways sort of through this situation. And eventually, the Washingtons publicly began to announce the matrimony of their granddaughter to all of their friends. So the acceptance of this marriage by George and Martha actually began the unraveling of Ona Judge's life. Judge had no clue that the fast and unsteady decision making of her owner's granddaughter would have such a direct effect upon her own life. Eliza Park Custis married Thomas Law on March 21st, 1796. So it was a sort of quick engagement, announced the engagement in, in February, uh, was married, by, they were married by March. The marriage signaled the beginning of major changes for the Washingtons and for their slaves. Judge most certainly knew that her time in Philadelphia was limited. By the March wedding, it became sort of common knowledge that Washington would no longer uh, serve as president, that he had planned to retire. And that the slaves who were living at the executive mansion knew that eventually they would return to Mount Vernon the following year. The idea of reconnecting with loved ones in Virginia must have given some of the slaves in the, in the executive mansion reason to celebrate. But Judge never spoke about this. She never spoke at all in, in any of her interviews about a desire to want to return to Virginia. She had lived in the North for seven years. And these are sort of crucial years, years in which she was a teenager and moved into young adulthood. And the thought of returning to Mount Vernon did not settle well uh, with, with Judge. I'll read through some of this with you as we, because it's a little bit blurry, but 
Uh, this is what I have up here. Are uh, is a copy of one of the interviews that Ona Judge offers in 1847 to the Liberator. She gives two interviews that we have at least that we found or that we recorded. Um, one to the Liberator and one to the Granite Freeman uh, newspaper, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Judge never mentioned a desire to return to Virginia in any of these interviews. Uh, nor did she mention any feelings about attachment to Mount Vernon. Her biggest concern would be the likelihood, if she made the decision not to return to Virginia, her biggest concern would be about her mother and her sister, who still lived at Mount Vernon. Betty Davis was Judge's mother. And she remained at Mount Vernon with the expectation of one day being reunited with Ona. Her other sister, Delphi, lived short from Philadelphia. Uh, Delphi lived in, uh, on Mount Vernon with her mother as well. Uh, Judge had two other sisters, uh, Nancy and Lucinda, both of whom uh, were born around the same time but sort of fall off the face of the, the record. So by the 1790s, we're, we're all sort of presuming that uh, they were deceased. And Judge knew that Delphi, her sister, was at Mount Vernon to help her mother as she moved towards old age. And Judge had concerns about her mother because Washington was not thrilled with her behavior and he wrote about it. Uh, by 1795, Washington wrote with animosity about Davis. The president accused Davis of feigning illness, of laziness, of occasional indolence, all of which could be punished by the threat of sale. So this was sort of background noise that uh, Ona Judge was hearing White in the executive mansion in Philadelphia that Washington was unhappy with her mother. Her mother was known to be kind of cranky, kind of difficult. She perhaps tried to run away one or two times. Um, and that she also knew that Washington was not beyond selling difficult slaves. So she worried about her mother and whether or not her mother uh, would be placed on the auction block. Now the likelihood of Betty Davis fetching a high price at auction was low. Because she was older, she was unable to reproduce anymore. Uh, judge may have known, probably did know, that her mother was not in Washington's good graces. So as the slaves in Philadelphia are realizing that Washington's not going to uh, continue on as president, he's going to retire and go back to Mount Vernon, what would their life look like now once they return to Virginia? What would Ona Judge do once they returned to Virginia? Her duties might change to include some of the more typical responsibilities of house slaves in the South, some of which could be more physically taxing. Although a slave, Judge was accustomed to a certain kind of labor while she was here, one that centered upon the care of Martha Washington. So she was not, domestic work, domestic um, slavery was extremely physical. It typically required carrying large you know, tubs of water on one's head from the pump to the, to the house for cooking, for cleaning, uh, making soap with lye and animal fat by hand, um, cooking meals over, bent over kind of cauldrons, baking bread, kneading dough with arthritic fingers, scrubbing floors. Very, very difficult physical manual labor was required for domestic servitude or slavery. But that wasn't quite what Ona Judge was doing while she was here in Philadelphia. Some of it, probably, most of it, she wasn't. <laughs> she was her attendant. Uh, and there were others who took care of those responsibilities. So, whoa, 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 what could this mean when she returned to Virginia? Would she be scrubbing floors? Would she be, I don't know, would she leave the house? 
if Washington was angry with her mother, what kind of reprisals could there be on her? So this move back to, this eventual move back to Virginia um, had all of the slaves sort of thinking about what this shift in their life would look like. Because the president and his wife entertained guests frequently and had these some kind of busy social calendars, Ona Judge got a little bit of privacy. When, she, when they went off for their dinner parties, uh, she was often left alone. She could devote to her needlework. She was a, a very uh, well-known seamstress, as was her mother. Um, she could have conversations with the, ha ha uh, the house staff, and some of whom were free, and some of whom were white and free. So this was a kind of personal and private time that would most likely end once she returned to Virginia. All of the slaves at the, at the mansion must have wondered what the future had in store for them. Um, moving from those who had resided in the North uh, for some time, were accustomed to northern light. Judge and her enslaved companions were still considered property, but they were living in a free northern city. And I'm under, I understand you all sort of did the tour, and so you understand when and how um, freedom begins in Philadelphia. But we're talking 1796, so we have the beginnings of Mother Bethel Miami, of, of an African church, of um, people like Absalom Jones and um, James Fortin and Richard Allen, all sort of serving as central free people, building a free black community. So here's this woman living as a slave for the president of the United States in a city where slavery is pretty much dead. She'd gone to the theater. Washington gave her money to go to the theater. She would go to the market on her own. She would purchase things. There was a movement um, that she had in Philadelphia that was going to be very different once she returned home. Judge realized quickly that she would not be around to witness the president's final year in office. Martha Washington's deep concern about her granddaughter trumped any relationship she had with Judge. So she sensed, look, Eliza doesn't know what she's getting into. She's been in this fast and furious romantic relationship, and word came quickly that she was pregnant. Not certain if that happened before or after the marriage, but let's say it was afterwards. She knew that she would be expecting a child soon, she was recently married. The only way she could protect her grandchild was to give to her her best slave. And that was Ona Judge. So Martha Washington planned to give Ona to her granddaughter as a wedding gift. And this way she could ensure that um, Eliza was the treated properly. Eventually, when a new baby came along, perhaps Ona would help with that, although they would most likely have another slave to tend to um, the children. She wanted to make certain that her granddaughter had the best support, more spe specifically the best house slave that Martha Washington knew, and that was Ona Judge. So although Judge had earned this top spot among the slaves for Martha, there was no way that Judge had enough personal or emotional capital to convince her owner to change her mind. It was done. Judge's fate was now in the hands of Eliza Custis Law. So, just a little bit of background on Eliza. She was known as for being this kind of, uh, we won't call her a wild child, that's what we probably say now, but she definitely spoke her mind. Um, she had uh, fits of, of tantrums, bursts of rage when she would come to uh, the executive mansion and spend time. So Ona Judge knew her. She spent time with her and saw her, how she worked. 
she would refuse to go to Sunday school or church. She would, um, one of her, her relatives wrote, quote, in her tastes and pastimes, she is more than, she is more man than woman and regrets that she can't wear pants. She also wrote, she's violent and has a violent and romantic disposition. She often appeared angry, completely shirking the social responsibilities of church attendance and dances. So she was irritable. She was volcanic. And Ona Judge and her, they had crossed paths more than once. So she knew once Martha made it clear that Judge would be returning quickly to Virginia, that her life was going to, to go from bad to worse. And this, of course, prompted Judge to think about her alternatives. Another major concern for Judge, once she learned that she would be relocated to Eliza's house, focused on the new member of the Washington family, this Thomas Law. He was somewhat of a wild card. And having made a good deal of money in India, as I said, he arrived, participated in the game of land speculation. He was an opportunist, businessman. However, it wouldn't have been Law's money that Judge was concerned about. Judge would have seen his two biracial children and would have immediately been concerned. What biracial children were far from uncommon at Mount Vernon, Judge herself was the product of such a union. Her father was uh, a white Englishman who was indentured at Mount Vernon, named Andrew Judge. Her mother was uh, Betty Davis, a slave who came with uh, Martha Washington to the marriage. So, while biracial children were far from uncommon, the secrecy around Law and his family and these kids must have been worrisome. For female slaves, a master's sexual desires were always a threat. Would Judge become the victim of a new master with a sexual interest that fell outside the realm of marriage? Now, from everything that I've been able to see, that did not happen with George Washington and Ona. Wish it did, because then the book would have been even better, <laughs> juicier, but I can't find it anywhere. George didn't roll like that, at least not with Ona. Um, so, for the most part, at least while living in Philadelphia, she may have been concerned about her protection of her body from other servants, perhaps other slaves, but the master, she was not really concerned with. Moving back to Virginia to this man she did not know who had biracial children worried her. Um, slave girls were, were taught at an early age to protect and prepare for the future. Author, activist, and fugitive slave Harriet Jacobs described her battle against sexual aggression when she found herself in the household of a new master. She wrote, no matter whether the slave girl be as black as ebony or as fair as her mistress, in either case there is no shadow of law to protect her from insult, from violence, or even from death. All of these are inflicted by fiends who bear the shape of men. For a young childless woman like Judge, the dangers of the unfamiliar must have served another prompt to run away. Living in Philadelphia exposed Judge not only to the benefits of owning one's labor, but also being able to select a mate, to have children that did not belong to someone else. This is the environment in which she grew up. Judge watched the cross and difficult Eliza Custis select a husband, and she didn't care who he was or what other people thought. She began a life of her own and was now married and on her way to motherhood. A legal marriage would be an impossibility for Judge if she returned to Mount Vernon. And the ability to select her father for her, ch a father for her children might also be far from reach. 
<clears throat> the decision to hand Judge over to Eliza Custis Law was a reminder to the bondswoman and to everyone enslaved at the executive mansion that they had no control over their lives. The time spent in New York and Philadelphia changed Judge and made her really reconsider life as a fugitive. Now, the president always remained, you know, slaves absconded or ran away from Mount Vernon all the time. And there's a, a lot of correspondence where Washington's writing back and forth to Virginia, saying, oh, you know, sell so-and-so. He didn't, he tried not to break up families. Uh, but for slaves who were very, very disobedient, he would sell them. Uh, he sold away Wagner Jack in 1791 for a quantity of wine to the West Indies. Um, and on other opportun other uh, moments, he wrote about slaves who were positioned to be sold. So Judge knew that her master wasn't beyond selling the slave for serious infractions and running away um, was one of those infractions. Judge also knew that slaves at Mount Vernon were susceptible to physical violence. In January of 1793, Washington himself condoned the whipping of a slave woman named Charlotte. She was a seamstress, she had been kind of mouthy, and uh, the uh, overseer, the state manager, whipped her and wrote to Washington saying, quote, gave a very good whipping, uh, and he had planned to continue this physical violence. Uh, he, did, he, quote, determined to lower her spirit or skin her back, end quote. Washington responded to his estate, matter, uh, estate manager stating, quote, and if she or any other servants will not do their duty by fair means or are impertinent, correction as the only alternative must be administered. So while, Judge, uh, while Washington does not earn this reputation of being a kind of horrendous um, slave master, he did use the same tactics and techniques that other slave owners in Virginia and beyond used to control uh, their slaves. Judge anticipated that if she ran away, her punishment would likely be the auction block. So these were heavy things that she weighed. Uh, in the early months of 1796. Also, uh, there was this thing called the Fugitive Slave Law that her owner had cracked it in 1793, which gave slave owners the right to go looking for their slaves in whatever states. And of course, as we move into the 1850s, that gets uh, better teeth. Um, but it didn't stop own a judge. Ona Judge's decision to run away was careful and calculated. She used very veiled language uh, to describe her escape. Uh, now this is the interview from 1847, but I'm going to refer to an interview that appeared in 1845 in the abolitionist newspaper, The Granite Freeman. Judge's uh, oral testimony revealed her fear and her confusion. But it also demonstrated that in the face of uncertainty, she turned to a free community of blacks here in Philadelphia to help her escape. She never named them. She knew that naming them could cause them great harm, imprisonment. So she remained very, very uh, closeted about her escape, even in the two interviews that she gives later on in her life. She wrote in her 1845 interview, quote, or what rather said in her interview, whilst they were packing up to go to Virginia, I was packing to go. I didn't know where. For I knew that if I went back to Virginia, I should never get my liberty. I had friends among the colored people of Philadelphia, had my things carried there beforehand, and left Washington's house while they were eating dinner. Judge explained that she was uncertain about her route or final destination, but she had created this community of friends. 
folks who were willing um, to help. Judge, as I said, never revealed their identity. Uh, scholars have hinted at some of their some of the identities. Some scholars believe that per perhaps uh, Reverend Richard Allen was involved. Uh, may have played a part in her successful escape, and I'm sure you've all read about, know about um, Allen, who was uh, one of the most influential black leaders of the early republic. Allen's often given credit for building a free black community here in Philadelphia, uh, and as many of you know, he had this business, a chimney sweep business, and it was documented by records that he had indeed cleaned the, the chimneys at the executive mansion um, in March of 1796. So he'd been there. Um, and I believe more than one time he'd been there to, to clean the chimneys. Um, and perhaps this was a moment that Judge met Alan. Perhaps she met him at a different time. Uh, but there's some speculation that there may have been assistance there. Um, not only was is there sort of speculation about that, um, but re Washington's records document that he gave money to own a judge to buy shoes. Um, so in his, he was, you know, a, sort of a, a wonderful record keeper, thank goodness. Um, he gave a judge on May 10th of that year money to purchase a new pair of shoes. And one of the things we know about Allen is that he also was a cobbler. He had a shoe smith shop in his own home. Um, and so there's the possibility there, perhaps, of having some help in at least planning, not just purchasing shoes, but planning an escape. Once again, we don't know this um, for certain. Judge was careful, and her intentions to escape remain, remained undetected uh, by her owners. She told no one at least no one in the household. Um, and she knew that she had, had to go. Many runaway slaves, um, you know, this sort of predates 1796, kind of re predates this time we know of as the kind of Underground Railroad. But for slaves who did escape, who became uh, fugitives, many headed towards Philadelphia and New York. And those were sort of likely places. They were larger. You know, at this time, there were about 40-some thousand residents of Philadelphia, 33, 34,000 residents of New York. That would be a place where you could go and maybe hide. Um, but Ona couldn't go there. She clearly couldn't stay in Philadelphia. She would be recaptured. She was known in New York. People knew her. She was out and about with Martha Washington consistently. So where would she go? How could she avoid? Um, recapture once she ran away. She was assisted. She looked towards the Delaware River to make her escape. Now this is the advertisement that appears in the Pennsylvania Gazette um, on the right hand side. It appears on May 23, 1796. And this, of course, is the ad that the Washingtons, or rather their steward, um, Frederick Kitt, and I'll read it to you because I know you probably can't see it very well. Um, Frederick Kitt eventually has to place an ad saying that she's run away. Now, if you notice, often, oh, I call her Ona Judge. That is how she names herself later on in her interviews. But we often see her name written as Omi, O-N-E-Y, as you can see in that um, advertisement. That's the diminutive of her name, like little Omi. So um, in, in all of my writing, I, I use the name that she gives herself. Um, and we've actually seen it written um, in other places in Washington's records. But uh, oftentimes we see Omi, but it's really, um, it's Ona. But in this um, ad, the Washingtons eventually have to fess up to having uh, lost one of their slaves. Uh, and Fre Frederick Kitt places this announcement 
in the Pennsylvania Gazette. The language of a runaway ad was similar to the others that appeared in the newspaper founded by Benjamin Franklin. The ad described Ona Judge and announced to the world that she had defied the president, quote, absconded from the household of the president of the United States, Oni Judge, a light mulatto girl, much freckled, with very black eyes and bushy hair. She's of middle stature, slender and delicately formed, about 20 years of age. Judge's runaway ad went on to describe the possessions that she had packed and that were sent off to her three African American friends. The ad noted that Judge had, quote, many changes of good clothes of all sorts, but they are not sufficiently recollected to be described. Unlike the majority of runaway slaves, Judge was not confronted with a lack of adequate clothing. This was a major problem for people who ran away, especially if you made it from uh, the south and you headed north, not having proper attire for your feet, uh, shoes, uh, or warm clothes for mid-Atlantic or New England weathers, a weather, that could be very, very difficult. Uh, that was not Judge's problem. The Washingtons were very aware of the need to maintain appearances. And as guests streamed through the executive mansion, poorly dressed slaves would serve as an embarrassment. So Judge, she looked nice. She had nice clothes. Um, enough to begin, and, and we know, a new pair of shoes. So enough to begin this new life. Frederick Kitt's ad in the Pennsylvania Gazette alerted slave catchers to Judge's probable escape route, and that was the Delaware River. And in his advertisement, Kitt sent a strong warning to anyone who worked on the docks of Philadelphia's busy port. He stated, but as she may attempt to escape by water, all matters of vessels are cautioned against admitting her into them. Kitt's assumptions were correct, for Judge did escape the city by boat. In her 1845 interview, Judge told, told of her journey to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on a vessel that was commanded by Captain John Bowles. Judge remained secretive about her planned escape for the entirety of her life, of his life. These interviews, uh, the Granite Freeman and the Liberator, they don't appear until 10 years after Bowles is dead. So she never gives his name for it until, uh, until he's, he's, he's gone uh, as a way to protect him, but also um, to protect anyone that could have been working with him as well. Judge sailed out of the port city of Philadelphia sometime during the latter part of May on a sloop named the Nancy. Like many other 18th century seafaring men, Bowles operated a shipping business with his partner Thomas Lee, and they took like lumber and leather goods and fish um, back and forth between the hub cities of New York, Philadelphia, and uh, Portsmouth. So we have, in the, in the newspapers, the oracle of the day. We know when um, his ship sailed. Uh, his ship uh, left Portsmouth on May 12, 1796. And if Bowles had made a direct voyage to Philadelphia, he would have arrived sometime around the 17th. It took about five days to get from New Hampshire, weather permitting, um, to Philadelphia. And this was six days before uh, Frederick Kitt advertised for the return of Mona. So some scholars say, well, maybe she hung out for a while and then went up to New Hampshire a little bit later. But I, I don't think that's accurate. I think that if you're a slave and you belong to the president of the United States, that you kind of want to hit the bricks as soon as you can. Right. Oh and then you're not going to hang around uh, for anything else. Uh, so the commander of the ship, Nancy. He wasn't known for being an abolitionist. We don't know but so much about Bowles. He was, he must have been a relatively safe vet and not a, not a known slave catcher, because that's the other concern here, who is going to take her uh, to Portsmouth. Her traveling alone would have been something that raised eyebrows, period. Let alone when she's a young, um, at least phenotypically um, African-American or biracial slave 
or free woman, perhaps passing herself off as a free woman. But the fact that she was a woman and traveling alone would have sent all kinds of flags, red flags. Up. But he turned, uh, and he turned his head on that. I'm sure he accepted accepted a, a fare for her to travel. She was able to save money. Washington was known for giving money to his slaves on birthdays, on his birthday. Um, and oftentimes he suggested that they send that money home. Um, but uh, many, like Hercules, one of his other um, slaves, held on to that money to purchase things for themselves. So it's believed that she held on to uh, her, her money and was able, and perhaps with help from three flags here in Philadelphia, pay for her passage to Portsmouth. Okay, so this is um, a marriage announcement that I found in the New Hampshire Gazette for Ona Judge. Um, she makes her way, clearly, to Portsmouth. And she avoids, evades Washington's slave catching acquaintance. We can talk about the kind of back and forth, maybe during the question and answering. How is it that she remains free in Portsmouth for so long? But I, I found this, um, this announcement. So this is uh, January 14th um, in 1797. So this is not even a year after she has we find her name in the, in the newspaper. Uh, they have it written as only judge with a G-U. Um, but in this town, she's married uh, Mr. John State to Miss Only Judge. And I first came across this announcement of marriage. I thought, well, wow, um, here's this fugitive woman who, I'm sorry, is President Washington's fugitive slave who is so kind of bold and fierce that she even allowed, didn't go by a fake name, did not change her name, kept her name, and it was printed in the newspaper with the name of her husband, who was a free man, by the way. Um, he was a free seaman, he worked um, as a sailor. And so within a year's time, Ona was on her way to creating family. She married, she eventually had three children. Um, she had to deal with Martha and George Washington trying to reclaim her for several years. They did not let go uh, of her. They did not let go of her until they died. Um, Washington sent uh, several folks up to try to recapture her. And Judge was very, very sort of skillful at negotiating her, her freedom. She was never set free. But what she does do is refuse to return. And when I read, and this is correspondence back between Washington and he brings the poor customs officer and Portsmouth is like, oh God, I'm dealing with Washington, trying to get a slave back, and people aren't really feeling great about slavery up here in New Hampshire, but he's commandeered me to do this. There's this really sort of intricate uh, relationship between Washington, the customs official in um, uh, Joseph Whipple in Portsmouth, and Ona. And Ona is telling the, port, the, the guy in Portsmouth, I'm not going back. No. And then says, well, I'll consider going back if he sets me free. So here's this like, <coughs> young woman, slave woman, <coughs> who has run away, who is still technically the property, really, of Martha Washington, negotiating her freedom with the president. And says just that those are my terms. And when Washington, of course, hears the terms, what do you think he says? Mm. No, it's not, no. This would set a horrendous precedent for every other slave I have in my house in Philadelphia or by slaves in at Mount Vernon. No, I don't negotiate. You know, it's kind of like, oh, we don't negotiate with uh, uh, terrorists, right? No. You come back and you get on the first ship. We're sending a ship. It'll take you right to Alexandria. And, you know, the judge knew what that meant. She said no. And she ran away. We know that she was 
harbored by free blacks in New Hampshire, a tiny, tiny community, but a mighty one, one that was able to protect the president's runaway slave. So Judge outlives both Washington and uh, George Washington and Martha Washington by decades. Washington dies in 1799, and then Martha Washington dies in 1802. But one thing to remember is that when they die, it does not mean the end of her life as a fugitive. Technically, Judge remained a fugitive for the entirety of her life. She was owned by Martha Washington's family, not George Washington's family. George set his slaves free upon the death of Martha, right? Martha didn't want to sleep with one eye open for the rest of her life, so she set his slaves free. I would have done the same thing, right? That makes sense. You want to protect yourself because if your freedom is dependent upon someone else's life, well, well. So, you know, it, it made a lot of sense for Martha to let his slaves go. But the majority of the slaves at Mount Vernon were not George Washington's. They were her slaves. They had come from her first marriage. And when she died, she did not emancipate those slaves. Those slaves were the heirs, belonged to the heirs of her family. So, Ona Judge remained a fugitive, a runaway, for the rest of her life. What's interesting is that her sister Delphi was actually removed from, uh, from Mount Vernon and she took Ona's place for Eliza. She went to become her first hand uh, slave. And of course, Ona would never have known this. Eventually she gets her freedom from Eliza. Eliza and Thomas Law, their marriage completely fizzled and fizzled nightmare. They divorced shortly afterwards, a couple years. Um, however, Delphi, there's a, 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 a owners of roots and ancestors lived in Washington, D.C. can still be traced um, to this day, although they had absolutely no contact with each other. Once Ona made the decision to move to Portsmouth, that was it. It's Portsmouth. So Ona made these decisions this very, very um, dangerous, risky decision to leave the President of the United States and to make a way of it for herself in Portsmouth, in New Hampshire. And she spent the rest of her days there. She dies in the late 1840s uh, after these interviews uh, were published. But she chose a path towards freedom. She chose marriage and announced it to everyone. She chose to be a mother. She had three children. Um, and she lived out her life. It, things were not easy for her. She actually, she died impoverished, as most fugitives did. Um, but she chose that life, as opposed to returning to Virginia and being the property.